Israel actually plans to exterminate the entire Arab Muslim population of the world. And the, the Muslims know this. And this is why their jihad, jihadism and their excesses have some basis in reality. Uh, they're trying to survive because they know, they know that Israel simply is interested only in genocide and exterminating all the Arab people, uh, bringing them under, under complete domination. And um, the Israelis are always exterminationists. Are they creating a Christian-Muslim war? Yes, that's all deliberate. See, there is no Christian, there is no Christian-Muslim war. Now, I have filed legal papers in this town here before in a law case that I have going on, in which I say, frankly, that a billion Christians and a billion Muslims are now at a war to the death with each other, and the only victor will be the state of Israel, because Israel is getting rid of all of its rivals and all of its competitors at once fell swoop. It's a brilliant move, <laughs> and it's also totally uh, calculated and ruthless. Is the real enemy Israel? Uh, yeah. Our Zionism, world Zionism. Uh, the state of Israel is nothing. It never has been. A, it's the tiniest state in the world, yet this is the most important state in the world. It's the most important state to the entire United States government because they put the, state, the interests of Israel before every other consideration, including the United States. Well, Ezra is the dominant intellectual of the 20th century, and four of his uh, proteges have been named the, uh, have been given the Nobel Prize for Literature after he edited the work. And the first one is T.S. Eliot. He, he first edited his poem, The Wasteland, in uh, 1920 in Paris, and that became the most famous uh, poem of the 20th century. It's not mentioned very much today, but... Uh, in the 30s and 40s, every college student could recite the wasteland. And uh, that's how uh, young men would pick up girls, is by talking about the wasteland. They'd get interested and go to a bar and have uh, sex. So it was very, it was very useful. <laughs> and after the wasteland, he became Ernest Hemingway's mentor. And he edited Ernest Hemingway. And he made Hemingway's uh, prose very crisp. And uh, Hemingway had been a hack newspaper uh, writer for a, a, a firm called, it was a newspaper called the Moose Jaw Herald in Saskatchewan, Canada. That was his stellar background to become a writer. And uh, so Pound took his material and tightened it up, and uh, he just had a knack for doing that. He could edit anybody's. See, the people, his protégés were all very dissimilar uh People. T. S. Eliot was a very stuffy Harvard graduate. Ernest Hemingway was a doctor's son from Chicago. His father committed suicide, and he committed suicide when he was 61. And I think one of his sons has committed suicide. So they have a knack for it. <laughs> and uh, so that was two of his protégés. And then William Butler Yeats is one is in all the anthologies. Uh, when Pound. I met uh, William Butler, Butler Yeats in uh, London. He was a very, very famous poet at that time, but he was writing uh, stuffy Victorian poetry. And so Ezra was horrified by that, and he 
I got him totally out of that and into more modern poetry. And so he became much more famous, and he got the Nobel Prize for that. And then his four, fourth protege was James Joyce, who wrote uh, uh, Ulysses, one of the most famous books of the 20th century. And uh, Pound edited that, and James Joyce was a terrible writer, and uh, he edited his, his uh, prose, and that became the most famous book of the 20th century. Uh, it was um, Ulysses was the Bible of the 1930s. Everybody talked about it. And so there was four Nobel Prizes uh, for literature from one writer. It's the only time in history that a writer has ever had one project get the Nobel Prize for literature. And uh, by coincidence, I'm his last living protege. They're all dead, long gone except me. And uh, so I'm patiently waiting my turn. And Ezra Pound himself was never uh, named for the Nobel Prize, although four of his pupils were, simply because he never uh, cultivated the establishment. He never, well, in the 1930s and 1940s, you really had to be a very active, outspoken pro-communist to get anywhere. So, of course, he was totally ignored by everybody, except the public. The pub public liked uh, his work. And uh, his novels were all bestsellers. Uh, they made a movie of uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls. That's the most famous uh, book, but he actually wrote some others that were quite good. So Ezra had these four protégés who had got the Nobel Prize when I met him, <coughs> and he really jumped on me and started uh, whipping me into shape. And uh, he assigned me to go to the Library of Congress and see what I could find out about the Federal Reserve System. Well, I really had a knack for research, and I found out the entire history of the Federal Reserve System, which is the greatest swindle ever known in history where a group of private bankers conspired criminally to take over the money and credit of the United States, which they did in 1913, and they passed the Federal Reserve Plan through the Democratic Party in Washington, D.C., and uh, it became a law of Congress. And this law handed over to this private bank uh, all of the money and credit of the United States, which was a pretty good day's work, and they've kept it ever since because they set it up as a monopoly so that the stock of the Federal Reserve Banks could never be traded publicly. It could only be handed down in a family. Or if a corporation bought the bank that owned it, they became possessors of the stock. You've never been able to buy, since 1914, you've not been able to buy a share of Federal Reserve Bank stock on the market anywhere. And um, that is monopoly. That's what they have. It's a monopoly. You see, they're totally insulated against anyone buying control of the Federal Reserve System. And John D. Rockefeller is one of the biggest holders, and he had his stock uh, placed under the Rockefeller Foundation, so it can never be bought or sold, so it's secure forever. And the other uh, people who bought control in 1914, they were the Schiff family and the Warburg family, and of course they still have their own uh, family. Uh, fortunes, and uh, they, can, they have a controlling interest in Federal Reserve Bank stock, in various Federal Reserve Banks. It's not all in one Federal Reserve Bank, it's in a number of, of Federal Reserve Banks. And so, I think most of the holders of Federal Reserve Bank have at least stock in at least five of the Federal Reserve Banks. What are the consequences of having the Federal Reserve control the monetary system of the United States? Well, the consequences are very important and they're never discussed by any economist in the United States. The Federal Reserve Bank is a central bank. And a central bank, this is not taught in any uh, economics class in the United States or in the world. A central bank is a bank of issue, which has the right to print all the money it wants. That's what a bank of issue means. You can print all the money you want. There's no control over it whatsoever. And right now, the central, the Federal Reserve Bank is printing trillions of dollars which are almost worthless, and uh, they're looking for hyperinflation, actually, <laughs> because uh, it'll be a repeat of 1924 in Germany. But I think they've taken some precautions. It probably won't happen, because they've been through all that. They know exactly what'll happen. And in hyperinflation, the money becomes worthless to the point where you have to have a wheelbarrow full of currency, paper currency to buy a loaf of bread, which is 
normally worth 18 cents uh, at that time. So uh, they don't want to go through that again, so they're taking care of that. But the Federal Reserve has printed so much uh, of this paper fiat currency, debt money, that uh, it's overloaded the world. China and Japan have trillions of dollars of our so-called national debt, which is our currency. And, um, of course, they know that when it goes, it goes. <laughs> when a currency becomes worthless, then nothing's more worthless than a currency that becomes worthless. So uh, they're staving off the inevitable by uh, hedging and uh, doing what they can. But uh, once you buy this debt, this uh, paper dollar currency, you're stuck with it unless you can find another sucker to take it off your hands. And there's nobody right now who wants, to, who wants any part of it. So China and Japan are stuck with it. And they bought this currency to maintain trade with the United States. That's all it was for. So in effect, we're financing our, our tra trade with China and tra trade with Japan by our Federal Reserve currency, which is neither federal. It's not federal any more than the Federal Express Company is a federal company. And it has no reserves because it doesn't need any current reserves because it prints its own currency. If you could print your own money, what, what do you need of reserves? You just go and warm up the printing press and uh, turn out another $10 billion. So, uh, and fa finally, it's not a system. It's called the Federal Reserve System. It's not federal. It has no reserves. And it's not a system, but I'm the only person in the world who's ever defined it in my works as a criminal syndicate. And that's what it is. It's a criminal syndicate, just like the mafia, which is one of its subsidiaries, and uh, the CIA and all the criminal syndicates work out of the Federal Reserve System. Because that's what a Federal Reserve System is. A central bank is a uh, group of bankers which ma have total control of a nation's economy. And they print their own money, print as much as they want to, and uh, it eventually becomes worthless and uh, through speculation. See, a central bank is set up for speculation. The Federal Reserve System was set up solely for speculation, and its author, Paul Warburg, who was a partner of Kuhnloeb Company in New York, which, by the way, financed the Communist Revolution, financed the Hitler Revolution, and financed uh, the Japanese uh, entry into World War II. So I defined in my work uh, that a central bank's principal role is for war finance, because war finance is the most profitable enterprise you can get into. And so uh, if you're a banker, you're looking for the best investment you can make, which is a war. For instance, the Iraq War. <laughs> now, when they set up the Iraq War, Halliburton uh, and Company, which is the oil, oil production company, <coughs> or an oil equipment company, actually, but it finances the big... Um, oil explorations, and uh, they found out that, uh, oil companies found out that a war is the most profitable investment you can have. During World War I, Rockefeller, uh, out of his patriotic goodwill, uh, upped the price of uh, oil five times to the U.S. government. That's how we won the war. And uh, that's how he became, he was already the richest man in the world. <clears throat> and uh, the richest man in the world wants to become the richest man in the universe, which is your next step, and apparently he made that. So that's what it comes. People wonder why a billionaire wants more money. Now, H. L. H. L. Hunt's <clears throat> sons, and four sons, each one of them started off life at 21 with a billion dollars at that time. And as you can imagine, they haven't thrown it away. <laughs> so there were... On paper, they're worth about $2 billion a piece at the present time. But uh, who knows what their holdings are. How was the Federal Reserve set up? Well, it was set up as 12 districts. So we had 48 states in the United States at that time. So you would think that the logical way would be to set up a Federal Reserve Bank in each state and have the 48 Federal Reserve Banks. But instead, they, they carved the United States into 12 districts of their own, which they called uh, Federal Reserve Districts. And these 12 Federal Reserve Districts are actually the government of the United States. They override the states and they override the federal government. And uh, not many people know that. They don't know that this is the Federal Reserve System of the United States. 
uh, the Federal Reserve Districts. Why didn't the American people rise up or say something about it? They didn't say anything about it because it was a hidden conspiracy. Uh, now I'm always called a conspiratologist, and I, people say I see conspiracies everywhere. But as I told a reporter for the Dallas Morning News a couple of years ago in a front page story, I said I've never had to, con to invent a conspiracy in my life. There are more conspiracies than I can possibly write about. So it's not a question of seeing conspiracies under every bed. It's a question of seeing conspiracies in every commercial activity and every political activity that goes on in this country. Because they always have a hidden agenda, which means that the conspirators have to keep their identities concealed. And it's always criminal in nature, because they always have some criminal objective to obtain by operating this conspiracy. That makes it all persons involved in a conspiracy to, for a criminal purpose automatically become criminals, criminal liable. And that is the case of everybody who has anything to do with the Federal Reserve System. They're criminal liable for uh, participating in a cr criminal conspiracy. And there's no other definition that you can make, because under law, a person who is involved in a criminal conspiracy is a criminal. And that's uh, the, the upshot of the whole thing. There's nothing more to be said. Why doesn't Congress control the money? Well, Thomas Jefferson and the writers of the Constitution specifically designated the Congress to control the money. And they designated that the um, monetary unit of the United States would be gold and silver. There is no specification anywhere in the Constitution for paper money. And what the Federal Reserve <coughs> Conspiracy of 1913 did <clears throat> it uh, made lawful a uh, paper currency which the Constitution did not authorize. But they passed it through Congress, so it became public law of Congress, and that made it official that uh, the, the Federal Reserve dollar became the uh, monetary unit of the United States as paper currency, which totally defied the Constitution, which provided that only... Uh, gold and silver could be the monetary unit of the United States, and that only Congress would control the monetary unit of the United States. So it was doubly unconstitutional at its, out at its outset, and it's become more unconstitutional every day since. Is there any gold left in Fort Knox? No one knows. I worked with a man named Edward Durrell who spent quite a fortune of his own, probably $100 million, trying to prove that there was no gold in Fort Knox. And apparently, he finally, I was able to prove it, but they never published the fact that it's not there. And they had a number of congressmen go to uh, Fort Knox, and they led them deep into the bowels of the earth, about 50 floors down in elevators. And there they were shown, uh, through iron cages, they were shown some stacks of what were supposed to be gold bars. And they said, that's the gold stock of the United States. But the congressmen were not allowed to go into the, past the gold bars, uh, the gold, uh, the bars of the gold bars. And uh, they were not allowed to, I think they were, they finally extricated one gold bar and handed it to them, and they more or less could see there was gold, uh, which you cannot determine except by a chemical assay. And uh, so a congressman was handed a gold bar, and uh, he agreed this is the entire gold stock of the United States. And that is the only uh, acknowledgement that we have gold in Fort Knox. What is the difference between a gold or silverback currency as opposed to a fiat currency? Well, a fiat currency is paper currency, which is backed by paper money, which is what uh, the Federal Reserve dollar is. Uh, and I, I say in my book that Congress in 1944, during World War II, when the American people were occupied with the war and so forth, Congress in 1944 hurriedly passed a law removing the last gold and silver from the backing of the U.S. dollar. So since 1944, the uh, U.S. dollar has been a, a paper-backed money issued against paper bonds. It's paper on paper. Uh, paper. So that, that's the st uh, status today. The, the, United, uh, the United States dollar is more or less the trading currency of the entire world, and it's totally worthless. <laughs> has no backing of any kind. What's wrong with paper or money? Well, 
You can take a Federal Reserve dollar bill and go to any store in the United States and buy a dollar's worth of goods. And so it's worth a dollar. It's accepted as a dollar. But it's accepted. Credit means, I believe. So that means that any merchant who accepts a, a Federal Reserve dollar says, I believe that this is a real dollar. <laughs> so that's all there is to it. It's still a piece of paper, a green paper, which is worth what any green paper is. You can figure yourself. Uh, you can take a sheet of green paper and you can clip out um, $800, uh, $100 bills. <laughs> Monopoly money is... It's Monopoly just, money. It's, it's the same as uh, the game Monopoly. What's wrong with central banks? Uh, you have to understand that all the settlers who came to the, to the America, including my ancestor, William Mullins, uh, were fleeing European oppression. And this oppression was primarily uh, government officials working for private banks who were oppressing the people, charging them too much interest to usury, and... Uh, taking their homes and property because they didn't have enough cash to pay off the debt. And so people finally fed up and set sail for the United States to get away from this. So, of course, every settler who came to the United States was totally against banks because they were running away from banks. That's why they came here. So obviously they, didn't, they did not welcome the idea of setting up banks on U.S. soil. They were firmly opposed to it. And Charles Lindbergh capitalized on that sentiment of the American people when he led the fight in Congress against the Federal Reserve System in 1913. And um, his son, Charles Lindbergh, Jr., became a very famous aviator and a world figure. And his entire public career, he never mentioned the Federal Reserve, which his father gave up his political career for. So he was run out of Congress because he voted against the Federal Reserve System. Every congressman who voted against the Federal Reserve System in 1913 was run out of Congress the following year. New York banks sent in uh, somebody to run against him, and they were lavishly financed with printing press money, and uh, they put him right out of office. And there's never been, since 1914, anyone in the Congress, except one or two isolated instances, We've never had anyone in Washington who would criticize the Federal Reserve System. Just as on television, you, you never have a radio program which will criticize the Federal Reserve System. Of course, you have three competing networks there who are ostensibly economic rivals and very de dedicated rivals, and they, yet they totally agree on everything like the Federal Reserve System and foreign policy and so forth. We've got to s defeat Hitler and we've got to defeat communism. We've got to defeat uh, uh, Nazism. Well, uh, if you ask the average man in the street in the 1940s if he wants to defeat communism, he says yes, because his newspapers and his politicians tell him we've got to defeat communism. At the very time of the Cold War with communism, the United States taxpayer was totally financing the Soviet Union which had been insolvent since 1917 and which had been maintained by the United States uh, taxpayer ever since. And Woodrow Wilson, who was born about three blocks from where we're sitting, uh, initiated this system of financing uh, the Soviet Union in uh, 1917. When he voted, Congress voted him a special emergency war fund of $100 million dollars which at that time was the same as about a trillion dollars at that time, uh, to prosecute the war against Germany. And he took uh, $10 million of that, ten of it, uh, one-tenth of it, and sent it to Russia to help the Bolsheviks in Russia. And there were no Bolsheviks in the United States Congress. So why did the U.S. Congress authorize him to send them $10 million? Well, they've been doing it ever since. It's and only been... What is that reason? Uh, because bankers consider communism and dictatorship as a good investment. A banker considers a d dictatorship as a perfect government because everybody is totally controlled. And uh, if anybody objects to paying high taxes or to paying debts, uh, you can set, put them in a concentration camp or execute them. 
which Stalin did in Russia, and which is the uh, the perfect system. No banker will ever tell you this. Well, well, David Rockefeller did during the 1940s. He said the reason he was so pro-communist at that time was because the communists collected their debts at the point of a gun, which he didn't say, but that's why they do it. <laughs> and uh, that is why dictatorship remains uh, the ideal of all, all bankers. What is the main mission of the Federal Reserve System today? Well, my book, The World Order, goes into that quite, quite extensively, which unfortunately is out of print. But uh, I found out when I wrote that book that the main uh, mission of the uh, banks was to start wars. And I found out also that it is very difficult to start a war. If you want to start a war with Iraq, uh, go out and try to do it. It's, it's very tough. And it takes years of hard work. So Bush had a great advantage because his father was head of the Central Intelligence Agency and a worldwide distribu drug distribution uh, operation. So he had plenty of money and plenty of political influence. He had no problem at all to walk into Iraq, although Iraq had never fired a shot at the United States. You see, you declare war on another country when they invade your country and try to take your territory. Or, yeah, there has to be some very good reason to have a war. Because you can understand that uh, it's very difficult to get millions of people to run out and kill each other when they have absolutely no bone of contention whatsoever. In fact, all the wars have had... See, Ezra, that's why Ezra got into this entire thing, and that's how he got me into it. He was living in Paris during World War I, and he had many young writers and artist friends who were drafted into the armies, and uh, some were for Germany and some were for France, and uh, uh, they were killed. And he couldn't understand how these great talents, very brilliant young men, uh, died for nothing. And when he spent years of studying the situation in eight languages uh, all over Europe, he found out uh, that bankers make wars to create debt. And that's the only reason. And that's the only reason... Uh, we went to war against Germany in World War I and World War II at a time when by, by census, 52% of the population of the United States was of German origin. So this is like a civil war. <laughs> the bankers, the central banks of Europe, and the, uh, they, couldn't make, uh, they couldn't have World War I. They'd been wanting World War I since 1885. But the central banks of Europe had already bankrupted every country in Europe. And it was impossible to have a war. They didn't have enough money. There wasn't a country in Europe, England, France, Germany, Russia. There wasn't a country in Europe which could finance one day's war anywhere. So that's why they were conspiring in the United States to get the Federal Reserve System passed, because the Federal Reserve System was uh, conjured up simply to make World War I possible. Without the Federal Reserve, there would never have been a, a World War I. No American would ever have died in World War I. So you can say they were murdered by the bankers because that was the only reason they were there. So you say that they don't start the war, but they conspire to make it happen? I mean, They make it happen, yes. How do, you, how do they do that? I mean, well, they do that through worldwide conspiracies, through Masonic uh, uh, and other secret brotherhoods all over the world which operate as criminal conspiracies, the Mafia, uh, the Masons, and uh, the Jesuits, and so forth. There are always these um, underground groups which are very profitable. When you get into one of those things, you get into very profitable situations. And when you're in one of these organizations, uh, you become very wealthy yourself. Yeah. Al Capone became one of the richest people in the United States, and he complained to the newspaper men. He said, I'm just like any other businessman. And he was. <laughs> All businessmen were like him, but they wouldn't admit it. <laughs> Is the United States government a corporate banking criminal enterprise? Well, it's a conglomerate of various criminal enterprises. There are many criminal inter enterprises in the United States. Some are quite large and some are quite small. Is but the uh, government a criminal enterprise? Always, always a criminal enterprise. Because... The elections are completely staged and manipulated from the beginning to the end. The candidates are chosen 
through a very careful uh, process of someone who will thoroughly agree with anything they want to do, foreign policy and economic policy. There are two, fa two ways you, you, you govern a country, and that's through economic policy and foreign policy. Because as far as a country itself, it's a limited operation. The United States is limited to the uh, borders of this country. Is the U.S. monetary system controlled by the Bank of England? Oh, yes, it is. I, I, I say that in my uh, book. The subtitle of my book, Secrets of the Federal Reserve, is The London Connection, in which I prove conclusively that uh, London still runs the United States. See, London is still the world market of the world bankers, not Washington, not New York, and not Tokyo, and not Berlin, but it's uh, London. <laughs> George Bush went public after I published this book. It was it had been published for about a, almost a year, and I'd sold maybe a hundred copies because I never advertised my books. They were never reviewed. Nobody paid attention to it. And George Bush Sr. was president at that time, and in November of whatever year it was, he started going on the television and talking about the New World Order. And, of course, the only book on the World Order is my book. So I sold out immediately which was very disconcerting because I have no publishing company and I had to go and print another edition. And uh, so it's out of print again right now. All of those people are begging for copies. In fact, they sell copies on the Internet for uh, very large sums because it's the only book. <laughs> what, is the one, what is the world order? The world order is a, a conglomeration of people who agree on the same goals and they run the world. So it's a conspiracy of uh, uh, bankers and politicians and political leaders, and uh, uh, it's mostly a very well. It's what uh, is, is loosely known as capitalists, and a capitalist is not a person who makes capital; he's a person who has capital, and he can make investments. That's what a capitalist is, and he makes investments that make money, uh, m more money. And that's all capitalism is. You invest in things that make more money than you have already. So when H.L. Hunt was the richest man in the world, he was buying whole radio networks. Uh, in fact, I helped him set up a, a television network. And he was going to have his own television network. At that time, there were still three networks. And he was going to set up a fourth because he had so much money that there was no problem for him at all to set up a television network. And it's a good thing for him he didn't do it because uh, he would have been murdered if he had uh, started his own television network. He wouldn't have lived six months because that is real power. They didn't care how much money he made. That uh, he was he was the richest man in the world, but it's when you take over the uh, levers of power that, that you become dangerous. And when he had his, his own television network, he could have ruled the whole world. So he would have been killed, there's no question about it. Why is it that people don't seem to care? Well, in the 1930s, scientists wondered how uh, Hitler could rule Germany and Stalin could rule Russia. These were vast territories. Uh, he could rule them with practically no army. And the answer was, they had discovered during the 1920s that adding sodium fluoride to the drinking water made the people very passive. Stalin found out that in his concentration camps, where you have to have guards, I mean, nobody's there because they want to be, uh, that uh, by adding sodium fluoride to the drinking water to camps, or the gulags, uh, he could uh, reduce his uh, guards by an average of four. You only need one in four, 25% instead of 100%, which comes to quite a bit of money. <laughs> Uh, sodium fluoride is a byproduct of the manufacture of aluminum, which is a very complicated, well, you have it in Florida. It's a very complicated uh, manufacturing process, and uh, a byproduct of the manufacture of aluminum is sodium fluoride, which is a very dangerous chemical and is very expensive to uh, dispose of. 
So uh, somebody came up with the imaginative uh, premise that maybe uh, sodium fluoride could be used to add to water and maybe it would help uh, uh, prevent cavities in children in their teeth. There was never any study conducted on this and no proof whatsoever that this was true, but Congress, with the judicious application of bribes, passed a, a, a bill enacting sodium fluoride addition to water supplies all the United States. And we have not had a revolution since. <laughs> and we had one party government ever since. Why did America get involved in World War II? Well, it was inevitable because World War II was simply a rerun of World War I, exactly the same cast of characters. And in fact, it was the same person, Colonel Mandel House, whose father was a Rothschild agent during the Civil War. And um, so uh, uh, the senior house managed to uh, have run, uh, runners, privateers, uh, bring cotton from the south to uh, the British uh, uh, mills so that they could operate during the Civil War. So he made a lot of money, of course. And at the end of the Civil War, uh, Colonel House was the only person in the state of Texas who had any money. So he took over the entire uh, Democratic Party in the southern states, which were occupied territory, and still are. You still have uh, two political parties in the south. Uh, they call the uh, carpetbaggers and the scalawags. The carpetbaggers are the uh, uh, Republicans, and the scalawags are the, the Democrats. And you have exactly the same government that you have had in martial law in 1865, with the same uh, people running everything. It's it's a perfect setup because everybody knows each other, everybody agrees with each other. There hasn't been a political contest in any southern state since 1865. Is there a difference between carpetbaggers and scallywags? Well, there is a difference. The difference is in the name. One group calls themselves Republicans, and the other calls Democrats. The Republicans, the Republicans are not Republicans, and the Democrats are not Democrats. As I say, they're carpetbaggers and scallywags, but they're, they're not known. The press doesn't use those terms <laughs> because it's offensive to some people. Some people would be offended by that. Was the United States ever really a true republic? I don't know that we were. I really do not. Because um, the people who rewrote the... Uh, we, we started off with the Articles of Confederation. See, that's where the Confederacy comes from. Because when the southern states seceded from the Union, they were exercising the prerogative which they had been given during the uh, Articles of Confederation... Uh, to secede at any time. You see, the Article of Confederation gave every state complete autonomy over its own, own power, over its own people. And so the southern states in 1860 decided to secede from the Union, which they had a perfect right to do. But in 1787, they rewrote the Articles of Confederation, and um, it was actually a secret convention of Masons in Philadelphia, and they rewrote the Constitution to create a federal government, uh, mainly for the borrowing power. The bankers wanted a country which could have a borrowing power and which could pay back the money. And that was not possible under the Articles of Confederation. The United States uh, colonies, when they won, won the American Revolution, they set up a governing uh, document called the Articles of Confederation of the United States of America. And that was our sole constitution. But then these Masons got together in 1787 and said, we need an um, instrument of federal power, and we need an instrument able to borrow money and repay it. And that's why they re rewrote the Articles of Confederation, and that's why they did it in secret, because they didn't dare tell anybody that that's what they wanted to do, to set up a dictatorial federal power, 
which the Supreme Court was invented to maintain federal power. The Supreme Court always says uh, that uh, the rule of law is the United States. Well, the rule of law is simply the rule of bandits who will control the United States. That is the rule of law. And if, if you violate that law, you'll be killed. Where are the Articles of Confederation located? No, the Articles of Confederation, I have never seen a copy of it. It's hidden somewhere if any copies exist. Who wrote the federal government has no power over any citizen of the United States? That's for me. I'm the only one who said that. What is that? What is that? Where, where did that come from? Well, that's the um, betrayal of the Constitution. That's my latest book, the last book I wrote. And I simply said in there that the general welfare of the United States, Roosevelt, passed, the Supreme Court passed his Social Security bill and all of his other bills under a false premise that the general welfare of the United States um, provides for this. Well, what, what it actually says is that uh, the government shall provide for the general welfare of the United States, which upheld the original Article of Confederation, which said that each state has uh, complete autonomy. And therefore, uh, the bill for the general welfare of the United States is the, the bill upholding the Articles of Confederation. But they perverted that, that the Constitution says that uh, you have to uphold the general welfare of the states, which is what it says. And all of the government programs for citizens are totally illegal because only a state has the power over a citizen. The Washington government has no power. The, uh, the Washington government is in the seat of government, which is Washington, D.C., and it only has authority in the 24 square miles of the District of Columbia. It has no power on any state in the United States. That is why Governor George Wallace of Alabama uh, threatened to arrest FBI agents who were creating revolution in the state of Alabama, which he had every legal right to do as a governor of the state of Alabama, because Washington had no power to send an FBI agent into the state of Alabama without Governor George Wallace's permission, which they didn't have. Is the dictatorship of the federal government the reason George W. Bush is in office today? Oh, yes. That was simply a plebiscite, actually, uh, just like Hitler had in Germany in 19... In fact, uh, the, whole, the uh, Bush family has very deep ties to Nazi Germany. Oh, yes. Well, in fact, uh, the United States government in Washington has carried out many of Hitler's policies, which he was unable to do because he didn't rule long enough. He had on his plans to bomb the nation of Yugoslavia before he attacked Russia because he knew that he had to uh, knock off the Slavic population in Yugoslavia before he would be able to attack Russia. And uh, so he launched an attack against uh, Yugoslavia, and time ran out on him on June 4th, 1944, when he attacked, uh, uh, on June 42 it may have been, uh, when he attacked Russia. He had to attack then, although he had not yet subdued Yugoslavia. And so uh, a loyal Nazi named uh, President Bill Clinton finally carried out uh, Hitler's plan of attacking Yugoslavia, and he bombed it into oblivion. <laughs> that was carrying out the original Nazi program. Because certainly the people of Arkansas, where Clinton was from, had no interest in bombing Yugoslavia. And I could give you many parallels of government action in the last 25 years, which is carrying out the policies of Adolf Hitler. Who financed Hitler's war? A good friend of mine, Tony Sutton, wrote a book called Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, and he wrote a second book. Uh, a book called Wall Street and the Rise of Bolshevism, which uh, are out of print now, Tony's did, but uh, the books are absolutely authentic, and they absolutely proves that every step of Nazism was financed by Wall Street bankers, and every step of communism was financed by Wall Street bankers. And the Wall Street bankers are tied into international money lenders? Well, they're tied into the consortium of central bankers of the entire world. 
the Bank of Italy, the Bank of Japan. And so, uh, well, these are people who've learned to work together, so they do very well. How is the Bush family tied into World War II? Well, I always have to start my lectures on Bush by pointing out that the Bush family itself has no background at all. The Bush family was, uh, <coughs> had worked for the Harriman family, and Jacob Schiff at Kuhn Loeb Company, which I mentioned earlier, uh, he financed uh, John D. Rockefeller in the um, Standard Oil in New Jersey, which became the World Oil Monopoly. And he financed the Harriman brothers in the, the Northern Pacific Railroad, which developed the whole western half of the United States with tremendous uh, uh, property rights along the right of way of that railroad, which made it probably the richest corporation in the country. And so um, <clears throat> the Harrimans, of course, made billions of dollars. And they, as really wealthy people did, uh, they had to have somebody to finance, to handle their money. So they hired a young couple, uh, a young uh, family, the Bush family, who were Wall Street operators. They became their money managers. And that's all they did was manage uh, money for the Harriman family. And so, um, by the way, Avril Harriman became uh, a world agent for the bankers, and his exploits were memorialized in a series of books by Sinclair Lewis, who was a very popular novelist in the 1930s, uh, about an uh, invented character. He called him Lanny Bud. And this was a very wealthy young man who traveled around the world on a first-hand uh, knowledge of uh, world leaders. He was welcomed into their offices and uh, directed policy for them. And Averill Harriman actually wound up from 1942 to 1944. Stalin had had a nervous breakdown when Hitler invaded Germany, and um, they had to send Averill Harriman as the, the world agent of the world bankers to Moscow as ostensibly as U.S. ambassador, and he went into Russia and uh, was the actual dictator of Russia from 1942 to 1944 because Stalin was uh, totally immobilized by his nervous breakdown. And so the whole World War II would have collapsed if Averill Harriman hadn't gone in and kept it going by uh, running Russia from behind the scenes. And of course, at that time, Russia was fighting Nazi Germany. So theoretically, Averill Harriman and the United States were uh, Nazi Germany's biggest enemies. And finally, the Russian army didn't uh, sweep through Germany and conquer Hitler. But that was done through Avril Harriman. It was nothing that Stalin accomplished whatsoever. <laughs> but nobody knows that. But uh, this is the connection of the Harrimans with uh, uh, Hitler. They actually defeated Hitler. But what they did, they laid Germany waste and it became a, an American colony, a colony of the world bankers. and has been occupied territory ever since. Both Germany and Italy... Uh, I mean, Germany and Japan have been totally occupied countries since 1945. Can you talk about your book, The Five Trillion Dollar Cold War Hoax? Well, The Five Trillion Dollar War Cold War Hoax uh, was exposed by uh, Norman Potteritz, who's one of the big Zionist uh, propagandists in the United States. He was the editor of Commentary in New York City of the American Jewish Committee, which was the unofficial Bible of world Zionism. Uh, commentary carried very serious uh, articles by respected writers on economic and political things. It was like the uh, Foreign Relations Council on Foreign Relations publication, Foreign Affairs. These were the Bibles of people in the State Department and in Congress to read. The, they had to read these articles to know what was to do, and that's how they got their instructions. And um, so, anyway, Norman Potteritz published his autobiography. Uh, a few years after the Cold War, and he stated in the, his autobiography, which was for the elite, of course, the average person would never read it, he stated very, quite frankly that the only purpose of the Cold War was to arm Israel to uh, fight the, the Arab nations. We're in Iraq today because Potteritz 
armed Israel in the 1940s, 50s. Uh, see, all this uh, came out of the Paris Peace Conference at Versailles in 1919. There's a book called 1919, uh, Paris and Versailles, and that's a very important book. It tells you everything that was done at the Versailles Peace Conference, and one of the main things was a, a very vigorous Zionist conference at the World Peace Conference in uh, 1919, and the Zionists got everything they wanted, including Woodrow Wilson, who was a very ardent Zionist himself. So he put Brandeis, who was the head of the World Zionist Organization, uh, which was a very powerful position, he put him on the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, that's when, when Wilson put Brandeis on the Supreme Court. That is when the Supreme Court became the operating instrument of the world conspiracy right there. And it's been that ever since. And that's why they voted to put George Bush in the uh, presidency, because uh, they do anything that they're told to do. Could George Bush be indicted for war crimes? It's more or less disinformation. There is no indictment. There is no indictment going to be handed down. And all, all of these things are simply making George Bush more secure in office. He's almost ready to become president for life because there's no opposition whatsoever. The Democrats have been totally shattered. They have not a single candidate. And I don't know what they're going to do. And the Republicans don't even have a candidate. They're talking about McCain, who's the biggest phony in the United States. He's married to, to a mafia princess in uh, Arizona. And uh, he's rolling in money. And he has all the prestige in the world. And he has 100% media cooperation. Uh, uh, you would think he's Frank Sinatra because the, the media swoons every time McCain appears anywhere. <laughs> Could Zionists make George Bush a so-called leader for life? Well, I think it could happen very easily because we've, we've elected uh, our puppets uh, ever since 1900 when the bankers really took control. Well, he's got advisors who could change that very easily and then could know exactly how to do it. There's certainly certain regulations you'd have to follow, and uh, you can make him president for life. Don't forget Napoleon made himself emperor for life. Napoleon was a complete nobody. You've got to remember that the American people are drinking fluoridated water every day, so they're, they can't object to anything. <laughs> it's very easy to uh, uh, do because... 9-11 was a step in the right direction, and they can repeat 9-11 at any time, like the Murray Building bombing in Oklahoma City and the Waco Holocaust of burning a church, an entire church uh, congregation alive in their own church, uh, which Hitler never did in his worst years. But uh, we welcomed it in this country. The CIA will support any dissident group, no matter how far out you are. If I had started a religious group or a political group at any time during the last 50 years of my career, I would have immediately gotten CIA support. What do you mean support? Uh, financial support and political support. You'd be allowed to operate. And the FBI would not come down, come in and shut you down tomorrow morning because that is only done by orders from Washington. Well, they like to have fringe groups all over the country of any persuasion uh, they really don't care what you believe or what you do, as long as you do something. They're uh, used to manipulate the population because some people are going to be very enthusiastic about whatever goofy thing this, these people espouse, and other people are going to be fiercely opposed to it. So right away you've got uh, opposition and conflict right away, which uh, is just handed to you on a silver platter. You don't have to do anything. All you do is turn these people loose and have them attack each other, and you got a war on your hands. Do you think the Zionists are planning a war in the United States? Oh, yes. Well, what I think is that they're having problems right now because uh, the fluoridation of the water and uh, the medical establishment has uh, made the children in schools so passive and the, uh, the working people so passive that they don't object to anything. They didn't know even there was no opposition at all to going to war in Iraq, which was uh, the flimsiest thing we've ever done in the history of this country, because Saddam Hussein had never fired a shot in this in this country, and he never posed any threat to the United States of America. There was not one American 
in the United States who was afraid of Saddam Hussein. And our army goes marching into Iraq and uh, pulls down his statues and throws him into prison. And they have a problem with trying him, which is that he had been a loyal asset of the CIA for 40 years. And uh, it's hard to get rid of one of your most faithful uh, <laughs> officials over a number of years. He didn't just appear on the scene two years ago. He's got a 40-year history with the CIA, which most of the employees don't even have. I mean, what's it all about? Well, all of the uh, foreign policy organizations in the world, at the end of World War I, uh, the Rothschilds organized a number of uh, groups called, one was the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London. It's called Chatham House. And that is the think tank of all of Europe today. And although its headquarters in London, the real headquarters are in Brussels, which is the headquarters of the Lambert family, which is part of the Rothschild family. And there, Brussels has been running the world uh, since, you know, we had an ambassador to NATO for many years because NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was headquartered in Brussels. And, of course, there was no coincidence that it was, it was headquartered in Brussels, the headquarters of the Lambert family, which is part of the Rothschild family. It was simply a family uh, company. Who do international bankers support for their control? NATO and the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute of International Affairs are all very heavily financed. And uh, if you become affi affiliated with them in some minor capacity, you'll have uh, an annual salary of, say, $100,000, unlimited expense account to travel around the world on missions and stay at the most expensive hotels and uh, charge accounts at the most expensive uh, shops to buy your clothes and so forth. And in other words, you become part of the international elite and you live like a millionaire, whether you have a dime of your own or not, it doesn't matter. And they will pay all these expenses until you make one mistake. If you give one wrong interview or say the wrong thing publicly, why, your history, that's your last day. And no one will ever hear of you again. And that happens quite frequently. What do the corporate bankers have to hide? What they've got to hide is their affiliation and control of all these foreign policies organizations. See, we have the Foreign Policy Institute and uh, Foreign Affairs, the think tank uh, magazine of the World Policy Organization. And all these are very expensive operations. And uh, so they're all run by very trusted and faithful employees, and they do their job every day. They're at the office every day. They don't uh, uh, run out on you. They don't rat on you or anything. They're dependable. And they have that job for as long as they live, and they know that. So they do their jobs, and uh, they do whatever they're told. It doesn't matter how goofy it is. You can do something as goofy as uh, invading Iraq on the basis of information about uh, WMDs that do not exist, weapons of mass destruction, uh, and get away with it because uh, these people are accustomed to doing really goofy things that nobody would, in their right mind would believe in one minute. And they're, they're very serious about it, and they have the background. They're... They were our people like president of Harvard University or president of Yale University. Are, uh, uh, they use a lot of corporate presidents like the, uh, the Aluminum Company of America president and people like that, General Motors president, who have stature, and they can do or say anything and nobody challenges them whatsoever. And that's what uh, reputations are for. They're for people they can use. For instance, I've been a world-known author for 50 years, and yet my name is almost completely unknown, except it's all over the Internet, because on the Internet they have no control. But in the, in the world media, on television, you'll never see me on television, because I've told people repeatedly that when you see anybody face appear on your television, that means that that person is totally safe and totally owned by the uh, establishment. Who controls the United States government today? Well, it's a conglomerate of various criminal enterprises. There are many criminal enterprises in the United States. Some are quite large and some are quite small. 
but the uh, government a criminal enterprise? Always, always a criminal enterprise, because the elections are completely staged and manipulated from the beginning to the end. The candidates are chosen through a very careful uh, process of someone who will thoroughly agree with anything they want to do, foreign policy and economic policy. There are two, th two ways you, are, you, you govern the country, and that's through economic policy and foreign policy. Is the Federal Reserve controlled by the Bank of England? Oh, yes, it is. I, I, I say that in my uh, book. The subtitle of my book, Secrets of the Federal Reserve, is The London Connection, in which I prove conclusively that uh, London still runs the United States. See, London is still the world market of the world bankers, not Washington, not New York, and not Tokyo, and not Berlin, but it's uh, London. <laughs> What's the main mission of the international money lenders? Well, my book, The World Order, goes into that quite, quite extensively, which unfortunately is out of print. But uh, I found out when I wrote that book that the main uh, mission of the uh, banks was to start wars. And I found out also that it is very difficult to start a war. If you want to start a war with Iraq, uh, go out and try to do it. It's, it's very tough, and it takes years of hard work. So Bush had a great advantage because his father was head of the Central Intelligence Agency and a worldwide distribu drug distribution uh, operation. So he had plenty of money and plenty of political influence. He had no problem at all to walk into Iraq, although Iraq had never fired a shot at the United States. You see, you declare war on another country when they invade your country and try to take your territory. Or, you know, there has to be some very good reason to have a war. Because you can understand that uh, it's very difficult to get millions of people to run out and kill each other when they have absolutely no bone of contention whatsoever. In fact, all the wars have had... See, Ezra, that's why Ezra got into this entire thing, and that's how he got me into it. He was living in Paris during World War I, and he had many young writers and artist friends who were drafted into the armies, and uh, some were for Germany and some were for France, and uh, uh, they were killed. And he couldn't understand how these great talents, very brilliant young men, uh, died for nothing. And when he spent years of studying the situation in eight languages uh, all over Europe, he found out uh, that bankers make wars to create debt. And that's the only reason. And that's the only reason that we went to war against Germany in World War I and World War II at a time when, by, by census, 52% of the population of the United States was of German origin. So this was like a civil war. <laughs> and in fact, the Constitutional Convention failed by one vote to make German the official language of the United States in the 1780 because uh, it missed by one vote, because the predominant uh, population of the country was German. Although it was settled by the English and the French, the English and the French were both too aristocratic to go and live in a desert, a wild country like the United States. And so when, the, when Rothschild hired the uh, Hessian troops to battle the, the American colonists, who were English colonists, and King George III realized that, that the American colonists uh, would not fight against their British brothers who were troops from uh, George III from England. And so he had to go to Germany and hire the Hessian troops who were mercenary troops. And the payment for that uh, rent of these troops became the Rothschild was the agent for that. That was his first start toward, toward world power. He made so much money out of the Hessian troops. So there was another consequence. All of these German troops declined to return to, to, the, to Germany because they had a whole continent here that they had their pick of. Why should they go back to Germany where every inch of land was owned by somebody already and you could only get it if you bought it? And it was very expensive. And they could stay in the United States and have a thousand acres of very good land for nothing. <laughs> So, of course, they all stayed. I mean, you can't beat a bargain like that anywhere.
Does Israel control the foreign policy of the United States? Israel con completely controls the United States. In fact, Ariel Sharon, uh, the uh, president of uh, Israel, has said that repeatedly, publicly. It's very seldom picked up by the press. But he says uh, the United States will do anything we tell them to. Not ask them to, but tell them to. When Zionism was first proposed in the early 1920s, you see, during World War I, uh, they got the Balfour Declaration for a national home for Israel, and that was uh, pushed through the uh, British uh, Parliament by uh, Lord Rothschild. And um, because it was such a raw deal, because nobody in the world uh, wanted a national home for the Jews, particularly the Jews, because they lived very well as a parasitic people in, all over the world, and they didn't particularly look forward to the idea of being confined to one country, <laughs> which, of course, they never have done. And so uh, most of your prominent Jews, including Jacob Schiff of Kuhn Loeb Company, who bankrolled the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, uh, Jacob Schiff, from 1920 to 1926, was an outspoken anti-Zionist. He believed that it would be uh, suicidal for the Jewish people to have a national home, which of course they would have to be loyal to, uh, as opposed to the freedom that they enjoyed, which was to be a citizen of every nation in the world, which uh, was ideal for what they wanted to do. Can Zionists destroy the world? The Zionists have brought uh, the world to the brink of total destruction, economic and uh, natural resources and everything else. You see the skyrocketing price of oil and the skyrocketing price of real estate in the United States. Uh, this is a, a uh, activity which can't go on at this pace long and a few weeks more, and everything's going to totally collapse. So uh, wiser heads, of which are very few, uh, realize that you can't keep going like this. But the bankers and the people who are making the money wanted to keep going like this, because when you're making trillions of dollars, you don't want to quit. <laughs> it's an addiction. And so they'll keep us uh, letting this go on a few more months and see what turns up. There is a uh, revolution going on in the world today, which is actually the world turning. As the world uh, turns, it goes to a certain phase and another phase and another phase. And that's where we are now. Everything is changing, but we can't see it because it's not a day-to-day -day change. But uh, there is, well, the Internet was one example, because under the Internet, people like myself, which, which have all media totally co closed, television, newspapers, and yet I've become an a internationally known writer just by doing it myself. It can be done. So uh, things are not static. Things are less static than they've ever been. And I look for, right now, you see you have a new generation coming up every 20 years. And that, uh, that new generation wants to make itself felt. They want to make its presence known. And so every 20 years you, you're facing an utter revolution because the, tw the 20 year generation, so, uh, many of them from wealthy families are from, from prominent families and have some stature in themselves. And many others are totally penniless and have no background whatsoever. But uh, they create a place for themselves. I started my own publishing company because they told me on Wall Street that they couldn't print my book because the banks would close them down on Monday morning. So uh, I found a child psychologist who would publish my Federal Reserve book. So it can be done. And the, the publishing media and uh, communications are advancing at a very breathless risk, uh, rate. So uh, you don't know what they're coming up with uh, in the next six months. Don't forget they put a, a bill through Congress to control the Internet. And it was ruled super unconstitutional by the Supreme Court because it was totally unconstitutional. They could, there was no justification for it forever. The Supreme Court represents the, the occupation government because the government is always an occupation government representing somebody else. The government does not represent the American people.
because a democracy is supposed to be representative government. Now, Washington today does not represent any American, except in a very tenuous uh, way. Was 9-11 an inside job? 100%. What I called it publicly, I was quoted in the New York Times after 9-11, I said it's a typical government operation. And I don't know anybody that said it better. And that appeared in the New York Times in the Frank Rich column, and Frank Rich printed it, but he didn't offer any rebuttal. <laughs> is it a United States government job, or is it a Zionist inside job? Well, it's more a Zionist inside job, okay. because the Zionism is the government in Washington. Everybody knows that. So the United States government is controlled by Zionism. Yes. Well, in Congress, have you ever heard any congressman stand up and make a speech denouncing Israel? Well, you won't. <laughs> With that said, and these bankers know that you know their time could be limited, no yeah. matter how much money they got. What would they be capable? Of? Well, right now they're capable of staying on top of the current, and they have enough money to buy into anything they want to. So they're trying to keep control. But of course, they have no control over the Internet. Anything can come on the Internet. And uh, so they're just trying to ride it out. And the Protocols of, of the Elders of Zion are a very debated document which appeared in the uh, 19th century, and uh, supposedly it's a program by which the uh, Zionists were going to take over the world. Uh, uh, the techniques that they would use to do this by controlling communications and education and governments and so forth. And it's a very detailed program for exercising power. And so this document was immediately denounced uh, and uh, the Zionists uh, denied that it ever existed and so forth. But it was finally brought before a court in uh, Basel, Switzerland, and a judge ruled that the, pro the Elders of Protocol of Zion was a forgery. And of course, a forgery is a, an illegitimate uh, copy, an unauthorized copy of a real document. So the judges uh, ruling that the Protocols of Elders of Zion uh, was a forgery, established that there was a real document somewhere called the Elders of Protocols of Zion, although none was produced. And so ever since then, whenever you mention the Elders of Protocols of Zion, uh, they say, well, that was uh, ruled a, pro a forgery by, by the court in Switzerland. And it was ruled a forgery, which meant that it was a copy of a document that it existed somewhere. I mean, when you forge a check for $100, there has to be an original check somewhere for $100 that you forged. So the Elders of Protocols of Zion is the same thing. The fact that the court ruled that there was such a document uh, meant that there is such a document somewhere and it's eventually produced. Uh, Henry Ford was the most famous uh, publisher of the Elders of Protocols of Zion, although it's been published in millions of copies ever since 1870. And the reason that Henry Ford published this, as you know, he was an automobile maker, and the fact is he was a very successful uh, manufacturer of automobiles, <clears throat> and because he was so successful, he became the richest man in the world in 1927. The New York Times named him as the richest man in the world. Well, as the richest man in the world, he became far, far game, so bankers set about trying to buy control of his stock and control of his company. And he needed capital to expand. He was expanding so rapidly, he needed a lot of capital. He needed hundreds of millions of dollars to keep his motor car company going or to sell it to somebody else. So uh, he tried to borrow the money from uh, Kuhn Loeb and the Wall Street bankers, and they told him they'd be glad to lend him the money, but they wanted uh, controlling interest. In other words, he had to give away the company. It would no longer be his. So he was very indignant about that because he was a Michigan farmer and he didn't like being robbed. And so uh, he began to publish uh, articles about these uh, Jewish bankers that tried to rob him. 
and uh, he made a crusade out of it. He launched a newspaper called The International Jew, which became a series of books, which I think were nine volumes, which uh, told the background of the Jews as uh, white slavers. They were very active in slavery. They brought slavery to America. And uh, their adventures in uh, alcohol, they were behind the... Uh, after Prohibition, they became the biggest uh, liquor manufacturers in the world. Most of it was uh, cheap whiskey, which was cut with raw alcohol, which blinded hundreds of people and killed many thousands more. <laughs> and uh, it was typical of their operations because uh, uh, killing killing people wholesale seems to be a, uh, a get-rich-quick idea that uh, if you can kill thousands of people, you're going to be very rich. My friend Ernst Sundel is in prison today in Germany. Uh, he's finally been charged after about eight years of being in prison uh, before they ever leveled a charge against him. And so the charge is inciting racial hatred. And Ernst Sundel has never been a, a member of any group which incites racial hatred. So he'll probably never be tried because that's what happened to Ezra Pound. He was in prison in St. Elizabeth's. Uh, under a capital charge of treason, punishable by the death penalty, but they never dared try him because when they called him in and said, uh, Dr. Pound, because he was a doctor of letters from Hamilton College, uh, how do you plan to defend yourselves on these charges? And Ezra said to them, I will stand behind everything that I've ever publicly uttered on politics. And uh, they were devastated because he had too big a reputation, a worldwide reputation, uh, to be tried when he uh, would demolish every argument they came up with. <laughs> so they got three government psychiatrists to testify that he was incompetent to participate in his own defense because he said he had said by everything he had said. So the, these psychiatrists said he was incompetent to participate in his own defense, and they held him in prison for 13 and a half years, and I was told on Capitol Hill that he would never be released in his lifetime. I was told that by General Lucius Clay and by Supreme Court Justice Tom Clark and two other leading officials in Washington because I had personal connections with them, and I didn't talk to them myself, but George Simpson, the founder of National Press Club, said, well, I'll ask around about Ezra and what his chances are. And he came back and reported to me that they all said he will never be released from St. Elizabeth in his lifetime. And eight years later, the government dropped all charges against him and he walked out a free man. Why was Ernest Zundel deported? Well, he was a Holocaust denier. They've called me a Holocaust denier also, although I've never denied there was a Holocaust because I've never even admitted there was one. So. <laughs> Do you think there was? Well, there was no Holocaust. You see, Hitler... Now, I'm the only person that uh, apparently knows this, and I speak about it very freely. Uh, in the waning wars of World War II, when uh, the Allies started to bomb Germany very heavily, Hitler moved all of the Jews out of uh, German cities into rural areas in these camps. And so no Jew died during the Allied bombing of Germany. And that was the, he was holding them as a bargaining tool because he knew he was going to lose the war so he could negotiate the terms of, sen of surrender uh, by the fact that he had saved the Jews from extermination. So now he's known for, for the fact that he exterminated the Jews. <laughs> so the Zionists flipped all this around? Oh, they flip everything around. In their favor. For th the name Hatemonger, which they've called me many times, and... Uh, a hate monger is a person who criticizes Israel. That's all that matters. That's the only th uh, definition of a hate monger. Is there a difference between a Jew and an Israeli? Oh, no. Because the Jews are the occupants of Israeli. Although the Palestinians lived there, it was originally their land, but they were dispossessed, and so they're not considered as, ex as existing. Right. Palestinians have no rights, according to... Uh, Israel. I think according to Israel, nobody has rights but Jews. Well, they have a perfect claim because they say God gave them a real estate deed to the property. 
and uh, which they refuse to show anybody, but uh, it's considered valid. Are the Jews God's chosen people? Well, uh, that occurs in the, the Old Testament. I don't know how often, but the Old Testament also uh, contains many pages of denunciations of the Jews by the God and threats to punish them for their transgressions. <clears throat> it's about 50-50. There's more uh, verbiage in the Old Testament of God denouncing the Jews and threatening the Jews than there is of uh, calling them as chosen people. <laughs> well, what's the difference between a Christian and a Jew? <clears throat> Theoretically, biologically, we're the same people. We're human beings. Right. Uh, well, the Jewish people, according to my book, The New History of the Jews, <clears throat> uh, the Hebrews got their name from H-A-B-I-R-U, Habiru. And Habiru meant bandits in uh, the Old uh, Testament. So these people were known as bandits all over the Middle East. But the Jews have their own book, which is called the Talmud. And in the Talmud, which is the Jewish Bible, they continually denounce Mary as a whore and a prostitute and um, Jesus as a madman and sometimes as a homosexual and so it's it's totally uh, uh, anti-Christian but uh, <clears throat> uh, they've never bothered to explain any of these accusations but uh, they're, they're, I mean they're rabbis, rabbis studying this for all their lives so they're apparently uh, conclude that it's absolutely true, and there's no there's no apology for using those terms. And of course, a billion Christians who uh, have some belief in Christianity uh, resent this very much about about uh, Mary and uh, Jesus being uh, all all these foul names. So this is done simply to keep. Uh, Passion stirred up between the various religions. Is the CIA controlled by Zionists? Well, my book, The World Order, has the only history of the CIA. <clears throat> I went through at least six histories of the CIA, which were between 800 and 1,000 pages apiece. And from that, I got the entire history of the CIA. And I have it all in 10 pages in my book, The World Order. I'm sorry I don't have one with me. <laughs> But as I say, this so-called friend carried off a copy about a, a month ago. I told him, I said, this is my print copy. I've got to reprint this book. And he said, I'll get it back to you in a week. And I, and I haven't heard from him in three weeks. Tell me about that. Who, uh, how does that start in your book, and uh, where does it go? Well, I give the entire history of the CIA, which was formed in 1940 in London by the British general staff. And... Uh, the chief architect of the CIA, which was established as a branch of the Secret Intelligence Service, SIS of England, which was established by the Bank of England in 1694 and became the best intelligence service in the United States because it had unlimited funds uh, because that was financed by the Bank of England. It was simply a private intelligence agency for the Bank of England, just like the FBI is a private intelligence agency of the uh, Federal Reserve System. When they had the uh, Ruby Ridge Massacre in uh, Idaho, I was tra traveling there and lecturing at that time. And so I did a talk show, and um, there was a young inter interviewer who was asking me about this, and uh, <clears throat> I said, uh, he said, well, what about all these police units uh, that are attacking Ruby Ridge. And I said, those police units are all Federal Reserve police units. And he said, there's no such thing as a Federal Reserve police. And I said, they're all Federal Reserve police. Who do you think uh, pays them? <laughs> and he cut me off. It's the only time I've ever been cut off on a talk show in my life. The thing went dead. <laughs> well, do you think people just don't want to know, or they just think, or what? Well, when you tell them the real facts, they don't want to admit it. And so the only thing is to hang up the phone. <laughs> or attack you. And, or, well, they do that constantly. Whenever your name, once they hang up on you, whenever you mention, your name is mentioned, if somebody says, why don't you have Eustace Mullins on, they say, listen, I had him on at night on this program, and he practically wrecked my whole program. <laughs> and that's true. I've taken 
50 talk shows hosts off the air in the last 50 years. Never with any intention to do so, but I would say more on the air than they wanted their audiences to hear. And so the, they would close down the show rather than ha risk having somebody like me appear on the program again. Is Mossad connected to the CIA? It's part of the same operation. In fact, Mossad is generally credited with being totally by 9-11 and that that was a Mossad operation, that they had a squad of Mossad people on hand at the time it happened. And uh, the New York Times and the New York, uh, the New York Times and the uh, New York Post both printed stories after 9/11 that 85 percent of the Muslim world believed that it was a Mossad operation. Well, when 85 percent of people believe anything, it's worth noticing. But the New York Times printed this to show how insane the Muslims are, and it kind of backfired. It, it gave legitimacy to what they were saying. Well, if you said that 85% of the people in the United States believe something, then you would have to pay attention to that. And in fact, uh, most all government programs of the last 50 years have been openly opposed by 85% to 89% of the American people. So what do we have except an occupation government? Because when we have a government which is approved by 10% of the people, something is wrong. <laughs> you said that uh, Zionists were on hand during 9-11. Where were they? Uh, they were in the buildings around there. They were directing operations, and they were filming, and they were, were recording, because they wanted a record of this situation. And so there are many stories, I mean pictures, of the buildings being hit by these airplanes, which... Uh, People have never seen those pictures because they're concealed. But they would tell you a lot more what actually happened if you were able to see those pictures. But why, why do you suppose that the, uh, Israel wanted to take out the uh, World Trade Centers? Well, Larry Silverstein bought the uh, World Trade Center, biggest office buildings in the world. He bought it in July, a couple of months before this uh, operation. And it was heavily insured, and uh, of course, when he just bought it, he just made a down payment. So um, he owed most of the money on it. So when the buildings were collapsed by demolition, which is the only way a building can come down like that, is controlled demolition. Because you can't knock down a 100-story building just by wishing it away. You have to have a, it takes about three months to plan all the electronics and the uh, demolition. Uh, and so this, uh, at 9-11, the building sank gracefully the way they do under any standard demolition operation that you've ever seen. What's the point? What, what was the, the point in them taking the building down? Well, it changed the world. That was the point. How so? Well, they, well the papers said that our world has changed forever and never be the same, which is a very remarkable goal. <clears throat> Just by blowing up two office buildings, you change the world. <laughs> what did they get out of it? Well, they got, uh, first of all, national panic. Second, uh, total government control. And the war on terror, which will go on forever, because we're going to be terrified forever. So we'll always be, uh, there'll always be terror. Terror is the most wonderful thing. I, I wrote an article, which is on my website, called the, the Necessity for State Terrorism, in which I conducted an imaginary interview with uh, Joseph Stalin, in which he explained why state terrorism was necessary. And you know, the Bolsheviks, uh, for 70 years, they, they killed an average of one million people a year, which is 70 million people. And that was done without a peep from anybody. Nobody has ever been charged with a single murder. You, you can kill a million people a year, and there's no blame attached to anybody. Look at this last attack in London. They put a little bomb and a little... Uh, Who did? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Supposedly Muslims did, but it looks like a standard Mossad operation because uh, 
I don't know why any Muslims wants to bomb the London subways, because <laughs> they ride it to work every day. <laughs> okay, so um, so uh, Israel attacked the United States on 9/11. Yes. To, and they and what and they got uh, they got Iraqi oil. Yeah. They got. Um, they're going to have Iran oil. Yes. They're going to have Syrian oil. And Saudi Arabia. And we kind of got that now, but in a kind of roundabout way. Well, Saudi Arabia apparently has been playing a double game all the way because the Saudi princes, the Saudi princes have always banked their money in Switzerland, apparently with Jewish banks. So the so-called Saudi billions are apparently completely controlled in Switzerland by Jewish bankers. The central bank mechanism has enabled the Jews to control all the banks of the world because uh, central banking is just that, centralized banking. That's all central bank means, that it's centralized banking. And if it's centralized, uh, the, uh, the Jews can come in from anywhere in the world and uh, gain control of it. Uh, so they, they control through debt. Yeah, through debt. Well, control through debt means control through unpayable debt. It's debt that can never be paid. The interest will never catch up with the debt itself. So, so it's is, a, that, is that what they did to the United States government, and is that how they're controlling it? Oh, yeah. So the United States government went and borrowed money for wars, and now it can never be paid back, so they're under the control of the... Well, that's why you had the big spenders, starting with 1933 with Roosevelt. You had big spenders ever since, because uh, the more spenders you have, the more debt you have, the more interest the banks make. It's a win-win proposition. For and bankers. For bankers. And it's a ruinous proposition for any nation in the world. As I pointed out, uh, since 1885, the Rothschilds were trying to start a world war because the Zionist International Congress at Basel, Switzerland, has called for three world wars. At the end of the third world war, they would control the entire world. At the end of the third world war? At, uh, which we are now. We're, we are, are we in World War III now? Well, I just filed a court paper in which I pointed out that a billion Christians are in fighting a war to the death against a billion uh, Muslims, which will leave Israel in charge of the world, which was predicted at the Sixth International Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland, in 1896. They had a speaker there who said, we're going to have three, three world wars, and in 1896, there had never been a world war. And uh, so after, war, after the Zionist Congress in 1896, you had World War I, World War II, and now we have World War III. Jewish people feel like they can be safe only if they control the world because they have developed a mythology throughout the world that uh, no matter where a Jew goes, he's going to be killed by somebody, and that everybody hates Jews and everybody wants to kill them. Well, you won't find that. In the United States, we have, pre we have had a, provided a haven for Jewish people from all over the world for 400 years. There's never been a program, uh, a program which is uh, a Jewish name for attacks against Jews. There's never been a program in the United States in 400 years, yet we have uh, multi-million dollar organizations like the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, which uh, claim that uh, there's enormous activity, anti-Semitic throughout the United States, and that Jews are in, in, in immediate peril of an annihilation here. And uh, this is pure mythology. There's no basis for it whatsoever. But on the basis of this uh, mythology, they raise hundreds of millions of dollars of tax exempt money in the United States, and the Internal Revenue Service and the Federal Bureau of Investigation uh, both completely back this program of, of illegal money raising for a, f a fake organization. And they all should be in prison for it. Well, why do you suppose uh, that uh, Jewish people are so paranoid? Well, because that's part of their religion. Because uh, from the beginning in the new history of Jews, I... Uh, point out that uh, they have always believed in ritual human sacrifice, and this has caused objections over where they've lived. And it's uh, their own practices which bring down retribution on them. It's not because 
Anybody hates Jews. I don't think you hate Jews. I, I, I don't <laughs> hate Jews at all. And I don't hate Jews because I have no reason to hate Jews. Why do they hate us? Well, because we're in the way. Of what? <laughs> of their world power. They want world power, and the only way they can get it get is to the only way they can obtain world power is to get rid of us. So then we're talking a major war. Oh yes, eventually. The thing is that. Uh, when you talk about a major war, you have to realize that uh, most people don't care one way or the other about the Jews. So how could you have a major war about Jews? Well, the answer is they manipulate people because we've had we're, we've had two world wars and we're at World War Three at, at the present time. Well, how did these uh, three world wars come about? By manipulation. Uh, we marched into the desert in Iraq, which was part of the old Ottoman Empire. There's no such thing as an Arab country uh, because they were Turkish provinces for many years. Uh, and so uh, we were fighting in Iraq for a country that didn't exist before 1919. And uh, that's becoming a major world war, three, between Muslims and Christians. Who are the terrorists? Anyone who opposes Israel is a terrorist. That's, what, that's where the word originated. We never heard of terrorists 50 years ago. <laughs> Who considers you to be an anti-Semite? The Jewish people consider Ezra Pound and myself as the, the real anti-Semites. They must be attacked and denounced every time the name is mentioned. When I published the Federal Reserve book in 1953, over 50 years ago, the book was immediately attacked publicly by the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith the same people who got me discharged from the staff of the Library of Congress, the only person ever discharged from the staff of the Library of Congress for political reasons in its entire history, because usually people at the Library of Congress are not politically active, and I was not politically active. I had never voted in an election at the time that I was fired from the Library of Congress. So that shows you what an activist I am. <laughs> Do you think that they are going to stage another 9-11 event? Oh, they have almost have to. It has to be something for I've said for a year, at least a year, that they've got to have another 9-11. And uh, I don't know what they're going to do.